and welcome to episode 404 of the Awesome Comics Podcast, the place where the small press makes one hell of a big noise. I'm Vince Hunt, and joining me as always is the creator of the comic series Vanguard, Dan Butcher. Hello. And the writer behind all kinds of wonderful jazz and smash street poetry, as well as Atomic Hercules, our favourite, it's Tony Esmond. Isn't 404 like a thing it says on a computer when it goes wrong? Is that right? Yeah, you... Is it not a web page? Not yeah. accessible. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's all gone wrong. It's all gone, Pete Tong. <laughs> but it's only just started. The show doesn't normally uh, go wrong, at least for another three minutes. No, so we're gonna, <laughs> so we're gonna go right. Oh, yeah, okay. it's gonna be fun. Got a fantastic interview coming up. Went well. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. Welcome to the show, everyone, and to this week's a jaunt into the talk about com- comic books and art. We're talking a lot about art this week. Mm. A bit psychological, don't we? Very much styling and profiling. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what I'm talking about. I, uh, we mentioned it briefly in the interview, but I spend virtually no time on uh, artistic uh, self-reflection. So, you uh, liar! Don't no. give me that. You I care, just, Dan. You care. But not that I don't care, but I just don't spend much time thinking about the stuff I'm doing. I just kind of do it, and I think maybe I should spend a bit of time with like looking back on what you're doing what's going right and wrong and etc possibly i suppose yeah, yeah. yeah but then again you know it's probably because you're spending all your time looking at our sponsor the lovely comic house yeah what? smooth yeah thanks um <laughs> yes this show as always is brought to you <laughs> by comic house the indie comic marketplace that loves indie comics as much as we do and as much as you do if you go to comichouse.com, there's a huge selection of titles on their database. Being It's growing all the time. And if you self-publish, you can list your book on there. It's another avenue for the world to see what books you have on offer. They also have a digital app. Definitely go and check it out. It's like a subscription service, basically like Netflix for comics. It's only like £3 a month. And you get access to an enormous library of digital indie comics that's growing all the time. Uh, Dan, what is, is there... What have we got there at the moment? Well, there's, I read some titles out last week. We've still got that Colin of the Undead, which you want to check out. Uh, Metal Bastard Adventures, that one uh, turned oh, yeah. your head. Yeah, let's check yeah. out Metal Bastard. Uh, we've got Lurker, Issue 2, Circus Sanguis, which I put Circus of Blood. Chrome Sky, Issue 1 and 2. We've got The Final Lullaby, Volumes 1 and 2. Death of an Equinancer, Issue 1. The Daughters of Albion 2. So there's this and a whole lot more. There's all of that, guess. plus tons of other comics as well from some of our guests. From us. Present us, yeah, we're all in well. So if you want to find out more, there's a 14-day free trial. And like I say, it's, it's compared to like yeah, a week. Read our comic, comic and we get big money sent through. We, we, yeah. do, we, we do. We can afford scampy fries instead of uh, chipsticks. <laughs> well, my fucking house is like Scrooge McDuck, you know, when he goes into the vault and he's swimming around the money. He's swimming, yeah. You can't swim yeah. through coins, though, can you? No, can cartoons. Yeah. Oh, well, if only we were cartoons. I wonder what that, car- I wonder what that cartoon would be like. Mm. We did. We had a cartoon once where the three of us got joined into an amorphous person and then blown that, up. Yeah. Well, yeah, but well, that wasn't a cartoon though, was it? That no, was, it was a yeah. comic, wasn't it? Vanguard yeah. and an epic comic uh, appearance. Remember the, the the three sixty one that got done? That was fucking amazing. Oh, glorious! Oh yeah, that was by Ed, wasn't it? Ed, yeah, yeah, Ed. Buddy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. like he looked around, and Galactus is like smashing through the roof. It was, was a cool, feature on it? Facebook that you could kind of spin the, the picture around to 360 and look around the room and there's the three of us on a desk reading comics and comic characters in the background. He looked up in the sky and Galactus was punching through the ceiling. Ed yeah. drew me as a dog. Yeah. Mm. Real. yeah. I quite like that. Yeah, yeah great. Like very, very realistic. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if you want to find out more about our sponsors, go to comichouse.com. So this week... As, as we said, we're talking a little bit about art and art styles and definitely ha- like how they change, how they evolve um, from project to project. It... And do you know where the subject came from? came from the Slack, where you should all be. Indeed. So, And if you want to know how to get involved in that, then, well, hang around until just after the, the interview and we'll tell you. That's how you keep them hanging on. Yeah, keep really listening. Mean. Yeah, keep listening for that. But yes, one of our lovely community put a, put a shout out about discussion. We were so inspired, we wanted to talk more about it. And uh, he's a brilliant artist himself. So here is our chat with the one and only Dr. Cole Henley. Right then, this week, we've got something a little bit different, a little bit special. 
for you all. We're joined by an illustrator and a comics creator who's part of the ACP community and recently brought up a discussion about art style that immediately got, I mean, that anyone deserves props when they get us three thinking at any, <laughs> any point, but we immediately thought that's a fantastic discussion point. So we got him on to talk about it. Welcome to the show, Mr. Cole Henley. Hello. Hey, Cole. Hey, Cole. Oh, I should correct you, it's Dr. Cole Henley, by the way. Ah, oh, there you go. Yeah. Nice. I didn't spend all those years at college just all to right. be called Mr. <laughs> what's your PhD, what's your PhD in, Cole? Archaeology. Oh, good man. Oh, of course oh, it is. Mate. You told me about that. We met, didn't you? Yeah. Mm. Oh, okay. Amazing. Yeah. That's, that's a strange a career route. Yeah, yeah. A strange career route from archaeology to comics. Uh, but... Via web design. So, yeah. yeah a bit of uh, I get you. Oh, I get right. you. That is yeah. quite a, that's quite a journey, isn't it? Well, I guess both <laughs> require reading old yellowed paper old, di old dirty paper <laughs> yeah. 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 And I now, mean old leaves yeah <laughs> and now uh, it's brought you here to us so in some ways it's the pinnacle the, yeah this is, this is it. It, it doesn't get any better than this it can Cole. only get better than this than this <laughs> <laughs> um but thank you for joining us this thank week. you for having me and uh like like Suzanne, like you brought up a very fascinating um sort of topic because as an illustrator, you're trying out different sort of. At the, at the moment, you're you're trying out some different art styles and and sort of trying to spread your sort of talents a little bit, um, you know. And you put a shout out to the ACP sort of community, you know. That a lot of people started talking about the, these sort of things, but how did that actually start? Because I know as a as a kind of illustrator myself, um, style is a strange thing to experiment with so what are your thoughts on it um so that yeah the, the sort of the shout out which was more of a cry um <laughs> it, was gonna be, it was gonna be that or a vomit but the, the, i didn't <laughs> didn't translate well onto um black so no i've been doing for five years now a, or trying to do an auto a biographical comic about a family member okay and mm. i can i've just struggled to find a style that would that, that I think sort of does the story justice. Um, I think sort of my comfort zone originally, because this would this would have been my first comic mm. to go into something that was quite technical. I yeah. think sort of you know drawing from photos and sort of I think having first got into comics in the in the sort of the, the, the late eighties, mid to late eighties, where everything was sort of quite fine line, black and white. I think that was something I was definitely looking towards. Okay. Um, but then actually what through going what was interesting is that because I my interest was in art was what wanted to draw this story but then realizing I had to actually write the story and then when I started looking into the kind of story I was trying to tell it the, the style the, the visual style was changing quite a lot right so for example when I was doing quite technical drawing it, it, that suited a sort of illustrated history kind of approach but when I wanted to actually have a more narrative based story, then obviously that needed something a bit looser, a bit more fluid. Mm. So that led me to sort of then try and explore basically just different media, um, stepping away from sort of fine technical pens towards you know, brush pens, paints, inks, uh, so, digital. So what's he thinking? Like when this story was evolving, the, the one he was going to be looking at telling, he's thinking the current style that I'm working in does not work for what the story I'm trying to tell. And you went out looking for a way to tell it. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So I think okay. sort of, when I started, the, the 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 mentality I had was because my background was archaeology and history, mm. that I would do this illustrated history. I mean, it was like this year, this happened. Here's a picture of the person that this bit of narrative describes. Yeah. But you rapidly run out of reference for those sort of things, particularly non-famous people. Um, yeah. And it's a bit dry. It's a bit boring. I think sort of it might be a bit interesting to historians uh, and maybe sort of a bit more accessible in your usual histories. But actually, at the end of it, it was it wasn't an interesting story. Needed okay. a bit more bounce, maybe. Is that what you need? Well, I just needed a human dimension, I think. Um, okay. Uh, you know, a big part of this project has been research, which we're not talking about today, but there's a lot of data and, and stuff to go through, most of which is German and communist and oh, quite dry. Can you, can, you, 
can you give the listener just a, and us a taste of what it's about? Are you able to do that, or is it still yeah, yeah, under wraps? Right. I'll, yeah. I'll, I should do the very short introduction, hopefully. Um, yeah. So uh, several years ago, my uncle died, and he basically, literally on his deathbed, told me I had to write the biography of my great granddad because he'd promised on his deathbed and never did it. Right. Um, wow. Okay. The so I started digging into this guy. He was German. My grandmother was German. She came here in 1935, and he was basically a bit of a big deal in the sort of socialist movement in Germany. So, okay, between the two world wars, there was a massive struggle for power and control of Germany um, between different factions: the right wing, the left wing, etc. And he yeah. was very heavily involved in that sort of extreme left side, the communist side. Um, so interesting, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I hope so, and so, so I, I can see why you started on that, on that, like almost like a, a, a more of a technical, like you describe it as technical drawing, because it's got yeah. that historical document feel to it almost when you say that. But I know that having seen a couple of the panels you've posted online recently, you've gone something different to that. I mean, it really is different, isn't it? How did you sort of travel between the two almost? You know, I think part of it came from realizing that the drawing approach and the stylistic approach had to reflect a very different kind of storytelling okay. um i mean it's sort of a blessing and a curse i think being the artist and the and the writer of the story mm. um i think there's been a lot of times where i wish i'd had sort of more of a collaborator on this okay um so it's be quite i suppose isolating and difficult but then also it's is that, is that the main reason for the isolation? You'd rather have someone to communicate with, or would you rather be in the position where perhaps on a Thursday morning you didn't have to think too much about it? You could just draw what he sent you. Is there is a bit of that, or I think it's just sort of um, being. I think I suppose it's the inner critic. It's sort of okay. sitting. It's yeah. having yourself as the main point of reference for critical mm. feedback. Mm. Yeah, um, and you know the, the amount of times I've started this project and then got so far down the road and then just pull the plug and it's going to have to start again. Right. Um, I've written about 12 different scripts, all of which going ranging from illustrated history through to sort of more personal narrative type approach. Have you ever considered combining different styles in one book? Because I know that is something be- some people would do, you know? Yeah. So the latest iteration, which is sort of working on, it will do a bit of that because right. essentially we will be jumping between different narrative strands. So there will be text heavier bits which sort of explain the context a bit more because it's quite complicated um and that would be more like the sort of more technically illustrated style and then the bits that are more personal um about sort of experiences and dialogue i mean that was one of the challenges in itself sort of trying to write dialogue for someone that you know existed and yeah. is a family member but you don't you're making that up so you sort of there's, there's a leap of faith there and speaking, oh, yeah. I'm guessing another country for a lot of it as well. Mm. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's all it's yeah. all sort of German and France and Spain, right? Um, yeah. So go back to your original point. I think sort of don't make it easy for yourself, Cole. Though, no, 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 oh, no, 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 I had an amazing opportunity to work with children's author Michael Rosen. Yeah. So he wrote a book in the sort of eighties, early nineties about uh, about a boy that goes on a school trip to a country house and everything comes to life. And through that, he discovers about the the origins of the country house and the you know these country houses, these stately homes. It's a bit political because it talks about colonialism and feudalism and okay. slavery. Um, but it's a kids' book, so. Mm. Um, I sort of, I, I don't even remember. I think I replied to a tweet, and then we just got talking from there. <laughs> wow, okay. And the next thing, Twitter was good for something. Yeah, I know yeah. it was fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. sort of, I've always looked up to him and his work. And yeah, we we got this unbound sort of said they'd do a crowdfunder for it. it. Took a few years to get the funding. Um, okay, okay. And then it was all systems go once they got the funding. Uh, but that uh, so that's the because it's a children's book then that was a, quite a big departure from the stuff I was familiar with and had worked with yeah um so I again sort of a journey through style moved towards well a something that I could work quickly with 
um i've sent you through some examples yeah. um, yeah. but, but i think what they show quite interestingly is just sort of how i'm trying different techniques partly to get a speed up because there's a, it was 120 pages the book so once i was gonna I, say there's a lot there is a lot of stuff yeah. to draw here to be fair, I, I was I was giggling because I was reading it today, and there's a couple of pages that have just like pure black. You know, it's all happening in a dark cupboard, isn't it? Just with word balloons, and I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I just that. imagine thinking, you thinking, thank fuck, today's work is just a panel on that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I was chatting to my wife on those pages about should I just do them shaded or should I just just make the reader take a leap of faith? <laughs> yeah, like, it works totally, man. Yeah, oh, I totally would have done what you did. Yeah, that's yeah, the way yeah. to go. Mm. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the, for that one, I, I I just tried started working with brush pens and, and character shapes, and absolutely because I, I had to, so I had to adapt it. So I wrote the comic script from a book. Oh, okay, yeah, and then and then pencil and inked, coloured, lettered. Um, there was no small amount of work there, man. No, oh, no God. Not, I wish I got a letter in as well. That was the one thing I was really struggling with. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it was it was a fantastic project, but it was really hard work, and I had to find a way to work quickly. So, so the style thing almost became an expediency thing. It was um, yeah, I was going to say, is that is that counted into the deadline issue as well? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the sort of deadline was relatively loose because it was just they wanted it yesterday, um, right, right. and the whole thing was because it was crowdfunded. They said, right, you prepare eight pages, and don't commit to any more than that until we've hit our funding target. Right. This was in 2018, I think. And then I had a health scare and then Michael got COVID quite badly. He was in a coma for a while. So everything oh, was yeah, on hold. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and then when he came out of the coma and he was starting to talk about uh, his experiences, but also his other projects, it just went mental. And it was suddenly sort of went from this situation where it was, don't touch it, to, you need it as soon as possible. Um, so yeah, I was just having to try and find a way, like a pen, which pen to use. I had to like to, to sort of make sure I could draw quicker. How could I distill those ma- three main characters into really simple shapes? Yeah. Um, but sort of keep a bit of playfulness and detail where needed. Um, so yeah, I think that was sort of, and I ended up really happy with the style I took. Yeah, it bounces along, man. I was yeah, use that yeah, phrase yeah. again, but it does. It jumps along as a great sort of story. You know, I can see kids digging it as well. Yeah, you know, that's what you, you got. To, so do you think that um, the way your style is is completely in your control? That's a question. Maybe for all three of you, because I'm not the artist here. But do you think it's you can just change style, or is will there always be a bit of Vince, Dan, and Cole in the artwork? There, no matter what you do about it. Yeah. What do you without, think, Dan? Without doubt. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I've had stuff where people come to me and say, "Can you do this?" And uh, if you're getting paid for it, the answer is always yes. Nine times out of ten. <laughs> yeah. Like any work in this style, can I look like a hand drawn style? And you go, yeah. But invariably, what you are kind of bleeds into the stuff you're putting out. You just got to kind of be careful not to uh, dial it up too much, not put too much of your own kind of spin in there. There's stuff, illustrative work that I've done. And like, I do some work for a charity. And sometimes I've done angles that, like, that's way too much like comic work. I've got to bring right. that back a bit. Like a perspective is a bit too full on and you just need it a bit more flat if, yeah. for, for what I'm doing. So, uh, yeah, stuff like that, I guess. What about you, V? Do you think you have the ability to change your style up enough depending on sort of just very different projects? Or um, do you think they will always be? I can, because I, I, I sent you recently, didn't I? There was an issue of June. I said, this mm. looks like you've drawn it, man. <laughs> this reminds me, because there's a personality to all of your art, isn't there, you know? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Well, I mean, I I think um, one of the things that is always nice for like any artist or illustrator to hear is like if their style is recognisable as their own. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I I know there's lots of comic companies where you got to do the house style, but I think when people can look at a book and go, "I know who's drawn that," that's that person. Mm. It mean it means that your art has a voice of its own. Um, and they're the artists we love, man. The ones we yeah. can look at and we can yeah. tell, and the ones, ones that we steal from a lot of the times because they found their own right. style. And other people try, you know, I want to draw like that person. Do you know what I mean? But um, yeah. I found when I've, um, when I've tried to sort of, you know, I think to my because I've got projects in my head, and I think oh, I've got this idea. I could never draw that. 
because okay. of what my style is. Um, and I've tried to sort of, you know, sometimes when I've tried to sort of step off the, the well-trodden path of my own style, it eventually, like, it's just drawn back to it like a magnet. There's always something that's like, I can I can still see that's my... I mean, is that a good thing, or do you think you're a bit trapped by it? I think um, sometimes it... I th- it's it's two sides to, a co- to the same coin, isn't it? Sometimes I do yeah. feel, you know, it's nice to have confidence in your own style and just be like, oh yeah, that's how I draw. I, I'm I'm happy, you know, I'm happy doing this. But sometimes when you want to do other projects, you might think, oh well, I, you know, I'm not going to do a, a a Hellraiser type book. Do, do you know what I mean? You, you, yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You, you close certain doors to yourself because you think I can't do that. Um, so do you think as an artist do I just lean into my style or do I go the other way or do I try other things which could I don't know could it break the original style that you were trying to get away from and you can't get back to that again you know um, me okay, pers- it's interesting. Me, me personally um, it always comes back around I'm always like oh yeah I'm going to draw this that just looks like I've drawn it I think that's the, it's the simplest way to put it whenever <laughs> I look at things even in my head, in my head as I'm drawing it, I'm picturing it as if someone else has drawn it, and then I look at it and I go, "Oh, that's clearly I've done that." Anyone can tell I've done that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know what it is, but when, especially comics eyes, I always feel like there's a personality in whatever they drew, draw. You know, it's like Kirby's bombastic or Gil yeah. Kane's, you know, extended features or mm. you know stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, we, it all does come back to a lot of. In, does it? Does it all come back to a lot yeah. of influences? Cold. Do you think your influences? Uh, firstly who are they and do you think they're reflected in what you're still doing now or i'm not sure they are because i I think and that's been a big hang-up for me because i still feel this is like new to me so i still feel like i'm finding my feet a wee bit Mm. um right i think what i have learned is that you don't have to have a style i think if and if i look at the work i'm doing on sort of biographical political comics and uh children's stories they're quite different and it's taken me a while to break to, to sort of to be at peace with that yeah, yeah. i mean yeah. for me the style is almost as much about the medium than it is about the okay that's the subject totally, matter yeah that's yeah. totally what i was gonna say as well right. I, th- I think it's easier for me to try something different if it's a completely different medium because i you know i'm not a painter or anything like that, but like for instance when i did black i just went for a different you know that looks nothing like what I normally do. Yeah. Because I just went. I just thought, right, I'm going to use this sort of digital brush. I'm just going to only use. It's, it's going to be like a silhouette sort of style. So it looks massively different to a lot of the stuff I ever, you know, that I normally do. Because I chose to do. It's a different medium in a sense. Mm. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, we like to compare and contrast, don't we? When we mm. describe, because obviously this is an audio medium for a visual, you know, thing. Basically, <laughs> radio. Uh, it makes yeah. no sense, does it really? But mm. we like to compare and contrast when we're describing art, don't we? And yeah. I mean, if someone had to say to you, Vince, you know, if someone was describing your book, who who would they compare you to? Do you think? <laughs> it's a difficult one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> who, who is that? You artist? Potato uh... painting. <laughs> no, well, what are you thinking? Think? Let me let me chime in with okay. something uh, Pete Dory yeah. said on, on Twitter. Oh yeah, um, that's good. He said uh, Gene Colan said it evolves naturally, like oh, yeah. handwriting. Yeah. And I tend to agree. You can add your influences, but it always comes out like you. Uh, like you. I think trying to achieve a style might be time wasting. Actually, it would just develop by itself. That's my me anyway. That's interesting. That is. Yeah, and I see what he means about Gene. Colan. No one draws like Gene Colan, do they? No. Yeah, no. you know, and you can also, tell immediately. I, I like the sort of handwriting reference as well. <laughs> Because yeah. I think it is the way the brain communicates with with the hand, doesn't it? Really, because everyone has such an individual handwriting style, and so it, then that links itself also to the art that, as well. That's also that, interesting because that a lot a medium as well. Because I was going to say with handwriting analogy that you know yeah. my handwriting when I use a biro is completely different to when I use okay. like a fountain yeah, pen good or, shout. Yeah. or a you know sort of brush pen or what have you. Yeah, it's illegible any way I do it, but it's still. <laughs> but we can also see we can also see a lot in a you know there's allegedly this whole sort of you know sect of people who can tell what you like from your handwriting. Do you think yeah. we can tell what you're like from your art, guys? You know, could I draw out some personality traits from the way you draw stuff? You'll never know the amount of people I've killed. Never. You'll never be able to tell that. He says killed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I think you can like get a bit of their personality from what they're drawing, and yeah, uh, yeah, uh, definitely without a doubt. It's yeah, it's uh, 
an interesting one when you sound sort of like the trying to achieve a stump uh, might be time wasting. What, what do you think of that as a premise? Do you think it's possible to sort of say, I can turn into turn... I'm gonna f- fight for this I, airbrush I, I, style? I think or, that, yeah, that this uh, we're in danger of going deep here, right? Um, let's do it. Art is very much a, a part of life because when someone is creating, someone is physically creating something. Um, that it's part of they're putting part of them into it because it's coming from their brain, and whatever's on the paper, whatever's on the screen, they're putting some of themselves into it. I think sometimes when you don't want to, you can't help but do it. And when people try to do something else that isn't them, that is the art that sometimes we say on the show is soulless. There's no feeling to it. Okay. There's, no, there's nothing. Yeah. You know, you can tell when someone's. You, 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 and also with it, with any sort of um, artistic endeavor, I I think you can tell when someone is enjoying doing it. I'd like. To. I mean, is there, is there something yeah. that poses to all three of you? Is there, is from following on from what Vince says there? Is there something that you wouldn't tackle, Cole? Is there something that you just think, nah, I just don't think I could pull that off, like a, a type of story or a character or yeah, anything like that. A hundred eighteen page children's book. <laughs> 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 No, I see. I see completely what you mean, and I think sort of yeah. it's interesting that it's a two-dimensional medium, but you have two-dimensional art, and mm-hmm. you have art that's definitely not two-dimensional. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's got movement, it's got emotion, it's got sort of pathos in it. Um, I, I love drawing. You know, I wouldn't be here if I didn't love drawing. But then also, I, 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 I found I'm creating comics a lot more challenging than I kind of hoped it would be. But that's partly because yeah. I've just ended up taking my two my two first projects are quite big, chunky, yeah. mm. meaty things to, to, to grab hold of. Yeah. And quite hefty sort of um topics as well. It's not like um you know you're not doing a sixteen page about popping down to Asda to get some milk. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, that's, that's, that's a good idea. I might do that as my next book. Makes me sad. I think I don't think that's a problem though, because like, I think, you know, because I have a full time job. I have to care about what I'm doing mm. to to commit time to it. So yeah. I think sort of that I won't deny with the Michael Rosen book, a big part of that was ego being able to work with a fantastic author and, and, you know, straight out the bat, my first ever comic book is a published book. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Full color, you know, I said 120 pages, French flaps. Um, <laughs> oh, look at you. Spot UV on the cover, you know, you know, it's it. downhill from there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> As if... the... go on, go on. No, I was just going to say, but uh, but also it was there's a there's a story in that story which is very political, and I'm extremely left of centre because apples don't fall far from trees, and it would be the same with the family story. You know, it's a, it's yeah, like, it's true. a relevant. Sto- it's not just a story about someone that used to live. It's a story that someone lived through it... a time that's mm, extremely yeah. relevant to what we're living through at the moment. So if it, if it turned out that your your was it your grandfather was Great the other side yeah. of the great grandfather was the other side of the political spectrum would you be doing it still well that uh that's an interesting question because yeah. um i don't know uh i don't i think i would probably be less inclined to but also mm. what has ex- happened is because of the turbulent times this spans there are some uncomfortable things that i'm having to yeah. sort of come across about his role in some quite serious conflicts and uh, political and military sort of challenges and things. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's uncomfortable. But I think if he was a raging capitalist, I would be less inclined to want to okay. devote yeah. my life and health to it. Okay, that's fair. All right, uh, cool. I was going to make a point. You know, like uh, when you were saying Vince about working in the house style and stuff, mm. we'd had all that through the kind of the nineties image boom where. You had like Jim Lee, yeah. and everyone in the Jim Lee studio had to work a certain way. The Wildstorm had to work a certain way. He was on Rob Liefeld's uh, extreme. You had to work draw like Rob Liefeld. But even then, like you can look back now and say, well, that that was fucking Brandon Peterson. That was so and so. Like they all had their little quirks. There's a certain and... little element that, that they. But there's a, there's through. a there's a there's no doubting it. There's a certain fashion in how comics are drawn. You know, I was I, funny enough you asked that, Dan. That's that's a great example of it. And I was also going a little bit before that and thinking. What about Neil Adams? You had a lot of people who wanted to draw like Neil Adams when he yeah. burst on the scene. You know, you look at early Frank Miller, earlier Bill mm. Sinkovich, you know, they're very like him, you know, and, yeah. and to 
it's not to get jobs in the industry because Kurt Swan and like these sort of people were still working, you know, and getting earning money. But yeah. it was there's a fashion to it, isn't there? You know. Yeah, yeah. But, I think uh, when Joe Madariah um, first worked for yeah. Marvel, his style looked like uh, a copy of Jim Lee. Like, right. Yeah, Jim it, Lee's it, another one, another great yeah. example. Complete, yeah. complete yeah. surprise to see like early Madariah work, and I thought this is nothing like what he became. He's come. But then again, yeah. look at Jim Lee, what he did. He he tried to copy Frank Miller. Do you remember in that? Yeah, film, yeah. Didn't he? he tried yeah. to go for almost like a Sin C's, um Ronin kind of style, didn't he? Mm. Yeah. I guess it's strange. I think it's stranger because what we I think things, what you see in a lot of those art, artists is the there's a career trajectory. So a lot of their styles come from having to follow certain paths, Yeah, which I think yeah. is definitely less important now um, for its merit or detriment, I don't know, but you know, there's a there's a an apprenticeship and a schooling and a way of learning how to do. Like, my, like you asked me about my inspirations, the the person yeah. that sort of stand out I've looked up to the most throughout my adult life is Mike Mignola, and okay. uh, yeah. you know, from reading his Dracula adaptation, um, his Gotham by Gaslight, on onto then obviously Hellboy and stuff, and. Mm. But if you look at his early stuff, he's just in, unrecognizably. Oh, it's not it's what really some of his uh, Moorcock stuff the other day. You wouldn't recognize it. Yeah. You wouldn't recognize him. Definitely not. Yeah. That's interesting. He's what found do you think... himself there somewhere, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. The, the style then that younger people were kind of uh, young people are uh, going for <laughs> nowadays. <laughs> them kids. Like, yeah, them kids. Because yeah. like, you see a lot of manga style artwork. Uh, yeah. I think it's a big fashion in coloring at the moment. I think coloring is certainly partly because of the technology i think but that's yeah. really taken a turn as well it's hmm. just so much easier to kind of like produce this kind of stuff where back in the day you'd have to break out the pens and then start well i say computer coloring has been around for a little while but yeah. it's so readily accessible to now people nowadays if you've got a tablet you yeah. can away you go you can color stuff up i think so oh, Vincent Dunn, do you work predominantly digitally or physically or a bit both I'm pretty much 99% digital. Yeah, I'm pretty much... Uh, I'm all digital now, although, I mean, I haven't really done... To, apart from, like, character sketches and all kinds of things and keeping my hand in the game. It, because of the iPad, it's all, all digital. But I must say, when I think about doing another book, I do think about the, the feel of the, the pen against the paper and like you know um let the let the mistakes fall where they may <laughs> that mm. kind of thing mm. but that also lends itself to more uh self-reflection slash hate when i look <laughs> look at pages, I, I, I don't go, know do, I, you, do you do you think it's easier to when you've got um, to be more self-critical when you can just control z all the time i th i think um the the control z could be a crutch in, to some people, I think. I think it could be easily. Oh, I don't have to worry about it because I can just undo it. Where there's yeah. a there's a real. If you think about it, like if you think about it before the tablets and before the digital, you know, if you said to some artists now, can you imagine like just doing a twenty page comic and you got nothing? If you want to, if you want to correct that panel, get the get the tipex out, get redraw over the top of it. When I see original artwork from comic books at like some of these conventions and you see the blemishes and you see the mistakes and you see when they've cut you know there's it's almost like a collage because they've mm. had to re-put this yeah. together firstly i think jesus the amount of work that that was and secondly it just also adds a little bit of character to it i think especially oh, i agree to totally yeah mm. i yeah. think people do like to see see the work i mean yeah. Yeah, i know there's a, a lot of people that love the kind of clean digital stuff but when you actually see the the, the sort of the craftsmanship and the white the, out and, yeah the yeah. hand behind yeah. the, the work it really it adds a lot the digital yeah. has yeah. given people so many tools do you know what i mean if you've got an ipad you can make something look like you've painted it with oils you know i know there's always a certain you can tell when it's a digital painting in, in some ways but some of the work that some people are the supremely talented people are doing on it just blows my mind hmm. like what the stuff that they're doing and it is it, it always comes back to the tools isn't it you know how because even though i work digitally I don't know how to do all of that stuff. You've got to take time and effort to learn yeah, yeah. it. You've got to become a master of the craft, no matter what you're doing. Um, I mean, do you but, feel like you're leaving something behind when you've drawn something on paper? Right, more. Do you know what I mean that's how I 
sort of view it. If you you know, there's something palpable there rather than a file in a hard drive. I think I think it's interesting. Like um, as someone who's a little bit of a hoarder, when I sort out my desk or like my drawing space, the amount of old sketches I find from like 15 years ago. Because yeah. I don't, I don't get rid of them. Do you know what I mean? But you yeah. never know when there's a little bit. You look at them and go, "Cool, that was what I drew like then." Because I think we're always evolving, aren't we? I think you know, even yeah. though, even if you think your style has never changed, you're probably wrong because something's something's. Tweaking. Shall I? Um, might be a good point to read Gareth's reply on the Slack. So sure, this yeah. is, um, give it a minute because it's quite a lengthy one. How do you, as an artist, define your style? I don't think an artist writer defines their style. They can influence it through the tools they use and technique, but style happens naturally. An interaction between the creator's experience, their tool, and their mood, plus a bunch of other stuff. And then he said, how does an artist achieve a style, work, and taste if you make something? You either like it or you don't like it. And if you like it, you can try to do more. And if you don't like something, you can try and do it less. Over time, that trying, he's putting in quotes, eventually becomes what you naturally do. But you only get there through work. And also by reading other work and deciding what you do or don't like about that other work in comics. That might be noticing a panel transition that you really liked or the way someone uses uh, silence for a particular effect, etc. Is it something to be worked towards or does it evolve naturally? Is it the third question he asks? And he says, artificially, naturally, you try and do something, but something else happens instead. And that's your style. That's interesting, isn't it? So I think there's a lot going. There's so much going on that it evolves. You know, almost we almost feel like it evolves in its own, don't we? We see that page developing. You know, it's almost like a creature on its own. Is yeah. that what you're saying? You think there? But it's That's... not. It's actually the amalgamation of a number of other things. You know. Yeah. Well, it's almost talking about style being a byproduct, then, isn't it? So we're sort of having a conversation about an artistic perspective, but actually, that's just the end product of a long series of processes to get what we're creating completed. Yeah, mm. I suppose by extrapolation, art is just life, isn't it? You know, it's mm. just there's a lot of things going into that page, isn't there? I think Depending it's interesting that, you know. when it's comics, though, or like you know, uh, a, a narrative, which which we're all doing, even if it's like real life narratives or any, you know, we're all telling stories, aren't we? Um, because there there is that finite element to it. Um, there's also, I think, people stars will always evolve, but you want it to be right for that story you're telling. You want to yeah. do, you want to do that book and go yes I got that right. The next book might might look slightly different. It might look completely different. But you want to be pleased. You want to look at it and go right. I'm, you know. You that's do, you... because that, are you saying that's why art and comic art are different because comic art is talking about what happens between the panels. Yeah, you know, I, got... I think I think in some ways I mean, comic art is a very it's a very special medium, isn't it? Um, mm. That's why we love it so much. It's so interpretive, isn't it? That's yeah. the thing for the reader. You, know? you can do so much with it. Um, and it's sometimes it's about what you don't put on the page as opposed to what you do put on the page. Um, mm. But yeah, I th- I think there's very much... The, the stories are always the, the secret to it. Like sometimes you can go into a, a gallery and you can see a painting and, you know, just say you've got no notes about it. You might, you might think up... You might look at it and go, "Oh, the way that that horse is stood there in that field." You know, you picture a story, but a lot of time with comics, you're telling this, you're telling the, the viewer the, the story. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's that element as well to it. Let me so I throw in Simon's quote because it follows sure. on what Gary yeah. says. So how do you, how do you as an artist define your style? And Simon says, "Random and unpredictable play in an attempt to get out of my own way." He says, how does an artist achieve a style? Style develops as an artist chooses to set individual processes in place. That's mm. interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Using the same tools and the same sort of solutions to recurring visual challenges. So in a way, I always think about this when I'm writing a comic. You know? yeah. So it must be more difficult for you guys who are drawing it. It's it's a jigsaw, isn't it, a comic, in a way? You've got to fit everything in in that page in the right order, you know? Yeah, because you want, you want to be... Um, the puzzle. Yeah, you want to be creating something that you're you're pleased with it, that does or if you're doing work for hire let's not forget you know the artists that are that are doing comics that they haven't necessarily had a hand in from the beginning um especially ip characters you yeah know, so many rings on captain america's shield aren't there you yeah. know this sort of thing yeah links in judge dread's chain <laughs> yeah yeah but like simon well, says there that you, it's, it, you can take the seatbelt off can't you yeah and just go go for it you know you can't be held back sorry carl you were about to say go on 
No, I was just going to say that sort of that I think you touched on something which is not often talked about, which is money. You know, I think yeah. sort of sometimes the, the word is expediency and it's easy to be self-critical if it's a pet project or a side project or but if you've got a deadline or you've got someone shouting at you, you know that the hourly rate isn't going to cover you being able to sort of second guess things three, four, five times then. Dare I mean, how was that, how was that with tomatoes? Yeah. Oh, go on. Yeah. No, no, no. Carry on. Carry on. Oh, yeah. So, how how was that with tomatoes, Cole? Because um, did well, you have to go back with some penny yet? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with with the I was thinking with the character design. Were you having to go backwards and forwards and get stuff okayed? So it was both the uh, it, it was sort of a dream collaboration, but also a bit of a nightmare in that they loved everything. So <laughs> I said, I'd send it. Right. Oh, look at this. Okay. Great. Okay. Well, look at this. Great. Look at this. And so again, that sort of <laughs> lent to me being quite my own critic on the work i was producing right um and i would do it in tranches so i would, I would sort of send them the the adapted scripts for feedback and then i would send them the pencils and then um i mean i did this goes back to what you were saying before but i my original goal was to do it all digitally i thought it'd be right much quicker mm. but they'd unbeknownst to me until um we started they had offered some drawn artwork from the book to ah, excellent those sort of top bidders uh, okay Helps yeah nice of them not to tell you then yeah yeah so i ended <laughs> yeah. up so i was like well do i just hand draw 10 of these pages and i'm like no that'd be ridiculous so so i ended up basically penciling it digitally and then inking it up physically yeah right. yeah that's totally what i would have done good like, good idea draw it digitally just one the pages already done print them out and then just print out some nice paper and then just ink ink the fucking thing I know that some pro art, you know, Marvel and DCIs who are working on superhero books would, and even image books will do that as well these days. Because we, as a collector, you know, people want the OA, don't they? You know. Yeah, you were saying like there's such a big kind of uh, a thing for it. It's, yeah, massive. Uh, it's weird that going, I've done some uh, traditional stuff more recently, and my I've uh, muscle memory fucking the digital stuff. Like I, I try and do. We mentioned it before by trying to do the zoom in, but flicking the fingers open to kind of zoom a picture <laughs> on the paper. Yes, yeah. before yeah. I even realised what I'm doing. Yeah, and so, I fuck, well, I've told you that before. I just that. if someone's annoying in front of me, I try and sweep them out of the way as if they're in. <laughs> <laughs> but like I, I, I don't spend hardly any time whatsoever, like stopping for a moment, thinking, right, how am I going to approach this next project? Or, project or what different approach am I going to take? Uh, style wise because usually it just goes out the window and I've got to start just doing it immediately I think that may be a failing of not you've got to spend a certain amount of time on self-reflection I feel and yeah. if you don't you, you might suffer for it I would say maybe artistically uh okay. I think the more I think more the like if I've got a project ahead of me the practicalities of getting it done and thinking right say in cold but it's cold situation I've got 150 pages of this book I've just got to fucking get these pages done. I'm not going to make the characters overly complicated. They're going to have a color palette of like three or four colors. So they're easy to do rather than thinking more of the artistic style. I think of the more, the commercial side of it and mm. the production time, uh, which does, does an artist do that? Is that artistic or is that more kind of coming under the branch of being a, a commercial artist? Hmm. I think one thing I learned on the Tomatoes project was to be self-critical in tranches. Okay. <laughs> so, right, okay. so not th thinking about chapters or blocks of 20 pages and then mm. trying to sort of, because at the very outset, I was just overanalyzing every single panel I was doing and just yeah. like, ah. And then thinking, you know, there's three guys, there probably will be guys that will find problems with the way I've done this, but uh, it's, I know you said swear words are fine, but I always find yeah. this quite challenging because because um, the subject matter. But I I would just always say to myself when I'll get it in and his, I'll just go like, it's just for fucking kids. <laughs> 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 it's just like, kids won't care. Kids won't care. They want yeah. an army praying about. Um, they want like a, a kid coming out of a painting. They want sort of soldiers firing small tin guns. They don't care that the sort of the the line weight on that particular wardrobe is slightly different to the previous no, panel. No, no, agreed. No. Yeah, yeah. Because it works on the page, man. Yeah, mm. yeah. I can only recall that time where this was fucking years and years ago. There was that book called Assault on Fortress Doom, 
and they would needed someone to do some character portraits at the end and i didn't realize how many so everyone who backed the book at a certain level i remember that book they got a character portrait i've still think i've still got the the portraits and the hard drive and they wanted like a turnaround time in a week and so that's not a problem but it was something like a hundred odd portraits like drawing from photos (laughs) and i was like holy fuck typical butcher yeah and i had to like i don't make those mistakes now like you always make mistakes when you're doing freelance nonsense and uh it was like that was a lot of work and i had to (laughs) quickly work out to do this as quick as possible (laughs) but uh yeah it's it's it's, is it corner cutting if you you're delivering the project on time i I, I don't know i think you've and also you've you've got to think of it in the whole yeah i and i I like it's like at the moment because i'm doing inking on this biographical comic and i'm sort of thinking I, i know if i take a step back that the coloring will bring a lot of it together Mm, yeah yeah it'll do a lot of the lifting of the bits that i don't think are working just in black and white but then gotcha. while i'm working solely in black and white because i do these in tranches i'm not going to sort of you know illustrate then color uh, a page and then start again on the next one it's going to be in a block it's it's, it's a lot of self of self-control what's the word what are, you, what are you doing on that two colors are you you going for a, a two color thing are you or... uh so yeah so i'm it's well, it's it's going to be monotone with red accents. Okay. So yeah. basically, it'll look black and white. It'll cost color to print, probably. Yeah, I know the I know the, I know the pain there, man. Yeah, mm-hmm. I was going to ask you about this because I know um you um um Claire Hemsworth is on the um, Slack as well, and I know she's commented a couple of times on it. Are you using an editor on this, or are you using a proofreader yes, or something so like that? There, uh, yeah. So uh, yes, I, I, Claire's had a look through. The script um so yeah so i think sort of i was sharing it with people getting feedback but then falling into silent i think i don't i think again it just comes down to sort of long periods of brooding in isolation that's a that's a, that's a <laughs> yeah, quote yeah. from <laughs> my archaeology days um, right okay. from Anne Brodell, there you go french annals historian but yeah. uh yeah so yeah i would just sort of sit on it and then just be paralyzed I and mean, literally be paralyzed progressing it because i'll just be i not overwhelmed with doing it just convinced that i wasn't going to do a good job of it and right. i think a big part of that was because it's a family thing that uh you know and it was the last thing my uncle i was literally by his bed where he died and he'd asked me to do it so wow. you know it's no, quite, yeah no pressure there then no pressure yeah. no, no. <laughs> i mean it's like I'm, immense pressure i couldn't think of a project that more that carries more weight <laughs> i don't want to load it up there <laughs> yeah, yeah no. it's like, fine it's yeah. fine if someone said that to me i'd be like almost have to well i've got to find a way around I'll this you, sorry, sorry what do you say couldn't quite catch that that's what i'd say the uh <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> nurse <laughs> nurse i think he was trying to tell me something <laughs> <laughs> the the other thing is um that self-doubt thing has got a factor into the, the drawing, isn't it? Somewhere, you know, the, the anxiety and the nerves and, you know, the overconfidence and stuff like that, that's got to play out on the page as well, isn't it? In a way, I suppose, for you guys. Is that true? Or I was thinking, yeah. why didn't you incorporate that in the story? I don't know if you've already written that. but Well, so the, um, the the latest, version 12 of my script, <laughs> yeah. of this part, is it starts off as autobiographical. So it's the genesis of the project, but also... Right. Um, just mm. trying to. That sort of prologue, you mean? So. Be... Yeah, but I think yeah. I've... a good way the to sort of bookend there... it with you, you sort of introducing the like. This is how I got to the story, and then this is how I ended it, and make it. And, and maybe that's uh, there's that hubris trying to involve yourself in the story more. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, there's a there's a leap. The latest, so the, there is a leap of fantastic. I think I think with all storytelling, even if it's biographical, it, it has to have a degree of fantasy. You know, you're making up words, yeah, that people never said. Um, yeah, yeah. You're 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 filling in the like you're filling in the gaps. You were talking about sort of rhythms in comic panels and filling in the gaps between. Well, that's you know, I have information about what happened on this date, and then twenty years later, something else happened, and I've got yeah, to fill in it, the gaps. Yeah, because it's there, like so. it's like you're not a documentarian because you're not you're not there at the time are you so there's mm. a certain element you can't of... document everything can yeah. You? yeah 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 no and even then the documents that i've got they are yeah. highly they are political but politicized because yeah. they right. they're what's left behind so the, the 
you know, having returned to Germany and living in communist Germany, the stuff that is remains is the stuff that's very sympathetic to that I mean, regime that was there. You, you know, because you've got this sort of histor- history background, but there's the unreliable unreliability of the stuff that's you're reading maybe as well, I'm guessing, is it? Oh, yeah, wholly. There's wholly, a corporation yeah. thing you've got to follow through yeah. on. You know? Yeah, and I think that's 100% why my uncle never got round to doing this. Right. I think he would, because he idolised him. He yeah. didn't want to confront challenging, I suppose, views of what he... Oh, difficult it, times it, man. Put him on. Weren't they, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, holy, holy. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, so I'm um, sort of doing this preamble, 10 pages or so, which is the sort of genesis, sort of a retelling, an imaginary retelling of the start of this project. But also, I think that has to has been essential for me to sort of be at peace with um giving myself permission to tell this story okay I think yeah. if that makes sense yeah um rather than being the sort of the, the technical historical sort of observer i have to recognize that i'm a participant in this story um even if i'm just telling it but actually placing me as a character in this story then makes that a lot more concrete i suppose mm. yeah cool interesting very interesting subject Nick. yeah yeah it's yeah. uh um, so you know when you talk about something and you're kind of voicing an opinion you're not sure that you have yet yeah. you're kind of you're trying to uh, it's interesting I mean, to me because from the point of view of not being the artist as well just seeing how you guys approach stuff because obviously write things for artists to do but you know it's totally in their hands how they carry it out you know hmm. yeah. i definitely think I, I i wish i'd either written this for another artist or someone right. else had written it and I'd drawn it. Gotcha. Okay. I think okay. sort of I was chatting to someone at Store Bubble about this, really struggling drawing the stuff I'm writing. And they just were like their their mind was just caving in on itself. They're like, What? Like that's the best. That's the best bit. Yeah. Did you do um a talk for Ladies Do Comics recently around this as well? Uh, oh we'll call them L D Z. Good don't plug, we, good plug. I've got that Thank coming you. up. So six oh, minutes. <laughs> If you are, happen to be in or around the London Provence, uh, there I'll be giving a talk on the 6th of April with two other comic artists um, at the Cartoon Museum. Oh, cool. Nice. Oh, nice. Yeah, who are the other artists, you know, at the moment? Or... Uh, oh, dear. Bad, bad, uh, don't worry. Bad me. I, know, I think Rachel Ball was telling me about it. I think she, you spoke yeah, so, about yeah, it. Yeah. yeah, so yeah. Rachel sort of asked me to give the talk. Um, I did a short... Course. She she does a, a course on writing biographical autobiographical comics. Yeah, and um, she uses characters that she and I created, which is lovely as well. Oh, wow. yeah, I'm very excited by that. Yeah, yeah. I was I, we had a bit of lunch recently and we were talking it through. It was very exciting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, she's lovely. She's lovely. I did so. I think it was after lockdown, but yeah. So they they were still mo- doing everything through the House of Illustration online. Right. So I thought okay. I had a particular pump I couldn't get over so I thought doing that course and actually yeah it was really hurt even though it was uh the course was on autobiographical comics it was extremely helpful and I think actually it's probably partly helped me to put myself into the story okay so are you you over that now you're sorry because you seem to be progressing quite well from the little bit the little bits you show us on the slack and stuff oh yeah definitely I think sort of I, I, I think I was just sort of hitting hurdles and hitting hurdles and then just something clicked. It was, it was actually Simon Simon Russell's suggestion. Yeah, I've been working with a brush pen, um, which I think that's one of the things I found hard having done the Tomatoes project, and then going into the back into this sort of uh, biographical comic is finding shaking off some of that style because right. that style was very particular to that audience. And I think a big part of it was I was just got so familiar and comfortable with using this pen, mm. it was just dragging me into this sort of cartoon approach. Yeah, I know Simon talks a lot about. He talked about it at Qvention actually. The sort of the the way you can you, you can make flourishes and draw. You know wh- where you're drawing from almost. You know physically, he's quite interesting to listen to about that. Yeah, uh, yeah. So he suggested trying a dip pen, which I I had yeah. one in a drawer yeah. and I hadn't used since I was at uni, um, twenty twenty five years ago. Yeah. Um. So yeah, and I I actually it just something clicked. It just made me sort of. I was describing it to someone, and it's like a it's like a loose precision. Yeah, it's sort of like you get the you get the tightness when you need it, but also because it's ink, 
and it's a dip. You dip. Maybe I should have guessed. Yeah. The name dip pens, bloody messy, <laughs> and you have to constantly be dipping your, your yeah. dipping your pen in the ink. So, but actually, it's been really. It's just helped me get over a bit of a hump. Um, a little bit freeing, maybe. Do you think? Yeah. Or... Yeah, and I suppose this ties into what you were talking about earlier about working digitally and physically. I think sort of. I think because professionally I work on computers all the time, I really. I am sort of digitally native and I find it really mm. helpful and easy and that would be the easy approach. But actually I appreciate the sort of the zone, the zoning out of pen and paper. Yeah. Or pencil yeah. and paper or what have you. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. There's a, I, I know certainly when, um, and like you say with the, with the dip pen, like a, a change in how you do your style, sometimes you have to just tell your brain, just let it, let it go and free it up. Mm. Uh, I've said it before on the show that, like when I first got the iPad, I'm so, I was so used to the actual physical touching the pen to paper, and I, try, I like first time I tried to do a sketch, and like then then the sketch was like, oh yeah, I really enjoy this. Tried doing like ink like I used to before, and it looked like I was doing it in a, during an earthquake. It mm. looked terrible. The line was <laughs> horrible and wobbly, uh, you know. And but then I was like, okay, if I use a different Brush. So, because of the friction on the screen, you think? Yeah, it's that partly, and, yeah. and also I, yeah. I found that for me it was just easier just to just be looser with the lines. You know, it was just sort of just letting the. You know how you see some people like will draw a circle just by, it's just a movement in it. It's just that sort of a loose sort of way of doing it. And I found that getting used to the the digital, especially using a stylus pen, was very much stepping back, the brain stepping back a little bit. And and sort of letting the the freer parts of the art breathe, that you know I th- I think that with some of like the stuff I've done the part some stuff that has never seen the light of day because I've over inked it I've overworked it and I've ruined it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's sort of that yeah. sort of oh god if only I if only if I had known when to stop. Mm. When to I stops? Think... Whenever I've tried drawing anything, that's always a mistake I've made. Yeah. When to yeah. stop? Yeah. yeah. You can just kind of totally overwork shit and it's yeah. start ruined it now. Especially Metaphor for life, my friend. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think shading. I think that's always the one that will get. I just think, I think this this needs a shadow here. Oh no, I've ruined it. <laughs> yeah, that's one of the things about traditional yeah. media. Once you made that choice, you're, you're kind of yeah. damned, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can walk but, it back with a bit of white white pen or paint. Yeah, or... yeah. yeah. It's just not the same, is it? Just, you, nah, cool. you, you can see the mistake so so Cole what what do you think the future is for this for this project and the way your art's going because obviously since that since the shout out and the discussion how are you feeling about it now uh definitely a lot more positive um I think uh so it's it's an epic undertaking and yeah. I'm going to have to, I, I recognized a while ago I'm going to have to break it up into at least three <laughs> chunks Mm. And we have still, so I don't know if I mentioned this, but uh, so because I had to go to Germany to do a lot of research, I did a Kickstarter five five years ago. Um, (laughs) And obviously it's not been produced yet. And actually the the backers have all been incredibly supportive. If anyone's listening, I I apologize. I think you can understand. We can point them in the direction of this podcast now to listen to your trials and tribulations. Can't yeah, you? well, I think yeah, they're, yeah. they're well versed in my <laughs> annual update. Of, I'm freaking out and really sorry. It's a lot more than I thought it was going to be. Right. Okay. Um, Always I mean, stay in contact. That's the big problem, isn't it? Keep yeah. Going. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm a bit guilty of the occasional ghosting and just to sort of just oh, if I if I don't recognise, then maybe everything's going to be okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So. Yeah, so in terms of next steps, I, I, I want to get a, a version of this done. Um, I've done some pretty good progress on inks this week. Um, I'm just trying to get into a rhythm. I think that's the hardest thing is just finding an allotting time. Uh, I mean, I've got, I, not by the by, really, but I've got a... So through this process, about three years ago, I was diagnosed with a autoimmune disease. Oh, mate. And the one... Um, the one nightmare about it is it just it's just energy sapping. It just means right. that I can't I can't sort of commute into work. I tend to work from home. Sort of I can only get a full day's work out if I'm sort of lying in bed going, oh. Right. That's really just, them, eh? 
Yeah, yeah it's, just, mm. it's, just, it's something that's happened. And in fact, it's just my body shouting at me going, you're an idiot. You've taken on too much. But um, yeah, it just slows things down a bit and it makes finding rhythms harder. But then once you're in those rhythms, it's just, yeah, making the most of them. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, so we... the short version is oh, I want, yeah. I'll, I'll have a, I'll have a version. I want later this year to have a, uh, a, a something, something done. Good, good news. Yeah. yeah, and well, if anything, the, another good thing that's come out of this is we got you to read Airboy on the Slack as well. Yes. Oh, so funny. I just, <laughs> Mate, that's that's hilarious. hilarious. You got that yeah, we love that book. I was laughing my ass off all the way through that. <laughs> that's a cracking. <laughs> yeah. I think it's because I said your style reminded me a bit of Greg Hinkle, and I still well, I maintain that. Yeah, it does. Very flattered. Well, there you go. Good man. Yeah. So good. where can people um, follow you or find out more of your work, Cole? Uh, so uh, Twitter's the best place. I'm usually ranting on there. Um because uh, I make websites for a living, that's it's it's the water cooler. That's where I <laughs> the landscape okay. I inhabit. Um, despite uh, Musk's attempts to get rid of us, uh, yeah. So I'm Cole Double O Seven. Uh, that was a part. I think it was a username I was given at uni. So I oh, okay. Call it. Um, big Bond fan as well. Right. Okay. Um, I was about to say, so, have, you been a- have you been asked about that name many times? A few times, yeah. I thought of it was accidental, but I, I, I embraced it. Let's say, yeah. Yeah, there was a few, there was a few embarrassing uh, usernames back then, but I think you've done all right out of that one, haven't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And if they know uh, too much, you can always kill them. <laughs> yes, that's two my... references to you killing people in this show. Yeah, yeah. Vince, what's what, what, going on? What are you yeah. about? I'm not talking about me killing people. You can't prove nothing. <laughs> oh, anyway. my calling card. Yeah. yeah so it's <laughs> Speaking of calling cards, yes, check me out on Twitter. Um, there's a link tree thingy on there, which links off to Instagram and other social things. And then there's also links to buy tomatoes, so you can get it from all good booksellers. Uh, but if you buy it directly from me, I get more money, and I'll even sign it for you. There you go. Hey. So go forth, buy the books, it's cracking. And uh, yet another wonderful creator for you to um, discover. Thank you. Yes. Much. Thank you very much Thanks, for, man. for inspiring us this week. Oh, oh. Yeah. Getting us to think. That was good. Yeah. yeah. Severity. Well, I'll, I'll come back and we can talk about uh, post World War II French models of history. And then we'll. Uh... <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now yeah. we're talking. Yeah. That'll be the, that'll be the bedtime about, uh, edition. So yeah, yeah, the Stasi asleep. disinformation campaigns. I'm sure we can talk a bit about that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. yeah. yeah. <laughs> What makes you think I'm not already listening to you? (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Oh, God, don't mess with my head, man. And there you go, folks. No doubt a lot of you, while you were listening, had a few sort of probably thoughts on the topics as well. Thank you to everyone that was uh, in the conversation about this. and the See, that's what comes from being on the Slack and getting involved in the conversation. That's what happens there. Yeah. There's a lot more discourse on the Slack, but I tried to... We couldn't get in too many of the messages. There's so much... And yeah, on we'll get, as well. we've, we've had four come in while we've been talking, man. I've just yeah. looked. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So do get involved on there. That's the best place. Yeah. So mm. if you want to get in touch with the um, the Awesome Comics Podcast uh, Slack a group, which is full of loads of different channels, mm. uh, you know, whether it be art process like we we're talking about here, or maybe promo maybe of your new product, promo, you know, maybe yeah. crowdfunding, you talk about crowdfunding, etc. It's a genuine uh, conversation and discourse, which is what we want. None of this just saying shit. No, no, yeah. no clickbaiting nonsense. This is just nice people talking about comics and having a discussion, yeah. which is what it's all about. So get in touch with us to find out how you can join. We'll send you the details, and then simple as that. Who knows? Who knows? You could be the next person to inspire us. Yep. To do an episode. So uh, speaking of Send inspiring, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got too serious there. I'd say something yeah. in yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Do you think that would be a good name for like a? Like a deliver, like a noodle delivery service. Send nudes. Yeah. Oh, I'd love that. That's a great idea. <laughs> Just write that down. Okay. Yeah. Someone, someone, write it down. Someone, someone can have yeah. that and put yeah. that in the book. There you go. Yeah. I only, I it's like that restaurant I told you I went into Prague, where I was a bit confused what was going on. Yeah, that sounded it sounded good. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> all the listeners going, tell us more. Well, we can't. <laughs> no. Because right, no, because right now <laughs> we've got some shout outs, don't we, gents? Hell so yeah. I do my two because I know that Dan's got a load. Yeah. Yes. So my first one is Erotech, a not safe for work sex robot office comedy. Bad bosses, crazy co workers, and sex robots. I, what could about, be better? I love that now. I love a play on words, me. And uh, <laughs> Erotech is just yeah, genius. It's great. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, what can we do? Now, it's now funny on Kickstarter. It's got about two weeks if you listen to this on the day of the podcast release. Um, uh, Sean is a Slack member, so he gets a big shout out because he's on the Slack. There you go. Another nice. benefit of being on our Slack. I have backed this, so I shall be letting you know what it's like. So you've got one cover, haven't they, that, that takes that uses that meme for reference. You know, like the couple the walking oh, past yeah, the girls does. and the yeah, guy yeah. is looking back and the girl's looking offended. It's got that as a cover. <laughs> Good stuff. Um, and the other one is, um, I've been away. I've been out of the country again this week, so I just got back yesterday to my copy of Madeline, which Yay, is a uh, big too. shout out to Simon and everyone else involved. What a fucking Cheers, class Simon. package that is. Yeah. yeah, really nicely done. Yeah, good stuff. There you go. There my two. Nice, damn. Right. I've got Bolt 01, a tribute to Dave Evans, uh, 60 creators, 140 pages plus, one awesome collection. That sale past this target. It's got another two weeks to run, so go check that out. We've got uh, Rare Another City Chronicles, the final story arc that's coming to Kickstarter. Oh, how long has that been running for, that book? That's got years and 10, years. 12, 10, 12 years, something like that. Yeah, maybe more. Didn't uh, you and uh, Susie Gander work on it long both, before yeah. we did the pod? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I yeah. think I drew issue two. Oh, wow. So, okay. Long time ago, that one. That was before uh, Vanguard, was it? Or? Yeah, that was kind of like I wanted to get into doing web comics, and I thought, right, I'll draw someone else's and learn the ropes. And that's what I did. Oh, nice. There you go. So uh, we've got Outbreaks, Issue 1, an ongoing zombie anthology comic, a comic by Marvel DC Comics writer and artist Will Robinson. Uh, again, that's Smash for the Target. When you listen to this, you've got a couple more days to run on that. That looks interesting. We've got uh, Burn With Me by Stephen Ingram. That's got oh, five days that. to go. Yeah, almost there, uh, isn't it? Almost there. Needs a little push, get it over the line. Um, we're there. Uh, last week's uh, special guest, uh, we've got Lawless Comic Con. Yep. Going around on the 28th and 29th of uh, May at the Double Tree by Hilton Hotel. Go to lawlesscomiccon.co.uk. Go check out last week's show and you can uh, find out a little bit more about it. Uh, the lovely Madeline Holly Rosing and Boston Metaphysical Society oh, yeah. Mystery at Pikes Peak, issue one and two. Fleeing arrest, the team arrives at Tesla's experimental station to face a dangerous turn in Caitlin's abilities and a murder plot that's blasted through its uh, goal. There's so much back material here on this comic and so much to read. I think in a lot of the extras and add-ons, you can get previous issues, so go check I it out. I still got to listen to the audio play of that they did. Same. Where, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah when yeah. she was on the show. Uh, uh, former guest, so look in our archives and find out yeah. about that. Go check that one out. And uh, that's it. That's all the shout outs. I blew through them quickly. Woo! Man. And you've still got breath to spare, Dan. Just, yeah. Yeah. Well, you're going to need it because it's around that time of the show where we're going to recommend some comics to you, lovely people. Some stuff to check out for the forthcoming week. Or whenever you heard this, who knows? Time is a strange biscuit. We've had a couple of people get in touch and they've been listening to uh, old episodes. So, yes. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. If you are a newer listener, Thank you for checking out the show. As you can tell from this, that wonderful and thought-provoking episode of the interview we just had, we're not always fools. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had some like quite kind uh, of yeah, we uh, a whole range of guests from yeah the mighty. You look back the, on it, yeah yeah, 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 and we have a laugh. But when it comes to talking about the actual medium of comics, we take it seriously. That's, that's why we're almost eight years later still here talking about it, man. Isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. And speaking of talking about it, Tony, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I've got the two again. So my first one is um, I'm fucking up there, the top book of the year. Already. Really looking really? forward to yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Lonely War of Captain Willie Schultz, written by Will Franz, art by Sam Glansman. Essays from Franz himself and Steve Bissett, um, with digital art restoration by our buddy Alan Harvey, who's the one who put it under my nose, actually. Love um, public work. Absolutely. Yeah, we're big, well. big fans of his. Great guest mm-hmm. if you go back in the archive. Um, published by Dark Horse, 256 pages, lovely hardback collection. A little bit pricey, £47.99 currently on Amazon, but well, well, well worth it. Um, so inter- there's an interesting backstory to this one. So Franz was actually only 16 years old when he wrote this comic. There is a rumour going around, which he he stamps on in the introduction, that he was 12 when he wrote it. He, he says, nah, it's bollocks. I was 16. Um, and he wrote this comic for Charlton between 67 and 70. It was commissioned by Dick Giordano just a single year before he ended up going and working at DC as an editor and, and could well contribute to the fact that it didn't continue um, for a long run. It's, it's quite a short-run book. Um, it was drawn by a veteran comic, artist and also veteran world war ii soldier sam glansman um it's hardback features the whole of the story plus a final chapter which is added which broke me by a guy called wayne van sant which is very good as well 
Um, I think sometimes we need to value war comics. It's an experience I went through recently, didn't I, when um, I read The Nam, and I think books like The Nam and Charlie's War and stuff like that speak to an awful lot of things. Yeah. About yeah. war, they're two not two absolute pillar like pillars. Yeah, they're the titles definitely. you just mentioned. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And um, it's not always like take this, Fritz, you know, or something like that, is it? You know, which yeah. we kind of, in a way, war comics were a big staple of UK. Perhaps anyone from America's listening to this, they might realize. But where the, U- the US, most of their comics were superheroes. Most of our comics were war or sports in this country. Yeah, yeah. and. I think there there were the opportunity to talk about a lot of different things and to reevaluate and examine a period of life that wasn't from that long ago. When you think this book was made in the late sixties, early seventies, you know it wasn't that long ago before the war. And certainly, you know, it's further away when this comic was being made than the war was to when they were making it. If that makes sense from that, yeah. for me saying that, um, I hadn't heard about this at all. Um, there's a lot of Charlton comics that I've sort of missed me by because they never really seemed to be distributed anywhere that I was buying comics at the time. Um, and it's this is a remarkable book for a number of reasons. It's um, related. It was whilst it is a World War Two story, it was released in the US. You'll tell by the dates during the world during the Vietnam War. Or um, albeit it's about World War Two, it does have certain parallels that play out. And Glansman. Um, um, Franz talks about that in his introduction. He said he would be signing comics and there would be a Vietnam vet standing there saying to him, I read your comic when I was in Vietnam. It's incredible, oh, really. Man. Yeah. Um, and it's told in the same way that Charlie's War and the Nam were told. It's told from the point of view of the of the regular soldier. You know, nobody's like a, ma- you know, Captain Major dashing, you know, this sort of thing. They're, they're just regular grunts. And this is interesting because um, he's a U.S. soldier who ends up fighting on the, not fighting on the, but he ends up having to go to the German side of the war to survive. So Willie Schultz, he's a blonde, blue-eyed U.S. soldier. He's wrongly accused of the murder of a senior officer that goes, and because of this, he get, he manages to escape custody and goes on the run. And because he has language, German language skills, and he, let's face it, he looks sort of Aryan as he describes it. He becomes, he, he finds... Um, a German soldier who's died, so he steals his uniform and survives as a panzer tank driver um, in the war fighting Americans. But he's trying his best not to kill Americans, but he manages mm. to befriend a couple of people in his tank. And it's it's, re- it's really interesting. Also amongst that, various things. It's, it's a long journey of what happens to him. And he's, he escapes. He poses both a US and German soldier. He meets a blind girl who he falls in love in the desert with. He ends up fighting this sort of monster of a man. But it isn't glamorizing the environment of the war. It's um, it's very much uh, the hell of war, if you see what I mean, which is the hellish landscape of war, you know, the, the way that these people are treated. And in a way, you could argue that the people who were just doing what they were told, you know, the corporals and just the regular soldiers were doing what they were told, you know, are almost interchangeable in these two nation states, aren't they? You know, in the, and including the UAE, he comes across a UK commander as well. <laughs> Um, yeah. I got, just interject. What yeah. annoyed me? I saw someone's review of All Cry on the Western Front. Okay, like, blasting it, saying, "Oh, it treats these these people as like they were like just normal people and like trying to get them to be sympathetic, and they were on the other side." It's like, mate, what fucking world are you from? Do you know? What yeah, I mean? no. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's a very polar. You know, it's just a very black and white view, isn't it? There, yeah, there's someone that. And some of the best, you know, cross, a movie like Cross of Iron or like the film you mentioned there and some of these movies, you know, you see the different sides, don't you? You see these people are actually fucking human beings, you know, as well. Of course, mm-hmm. there were some villains. Of course, there were some bad people. But sometimes some of these guys were just trying to stay alive. And it, it, during the journey, uh, Willie Schultz faces a number of sort of conscience challenging decisions uh, as he travels along just to stay alive, actually. But he does make friends. It's an interesting dynamic. But there's an implication of shell shock, pretty much, you know, PTSD implication, yeah. perhaps every every page. Um, I'm going to guess and say this this is perhaps why it wasn't super pop, super popular and why it struggled. Um, he struggles, Fran struggles to find writing gigs after this, and he ends up going through a number of careers. I think he writes in his introduction, he's now a fencing instructor or something. How cool is that? You know, <laughs> but he's got this history. It must have been lovely to go back and, and go through it. Um, there's a But what they've added to this is a final chapter, um, that is added to the collection, and it's incredibly powerful. There are a lot of powerful moments in this. I'm going to say buy this and go to page 118, which, which is the moment where Willie Schultz comes across a British commando called um, Kingsley. 
And the dude, the English dude there, he's in this sort of all black, you know, he's doing this sort of secret mission. Um, he he sums up the foolishness of war in basically two speech balloons on two different panels. Um, and because of that, you said there's a, there's a general practicality to what's going on. Um, so, but but please buy it for that stuff. But this this final chapter is kind of like a real end cap to the story of Willie Schultz. And there's a rush of memories um, and about his life since the war as well, and where he's gone and what's happened to him. And um, I, do you ever read anything or watch something, and you have, you have like a quiet moment after reading it? Yeah, really, yes. really brought it home for me. This one. Just absolutely brilliant. Um, it shouldn't be just ignored as just stuffy war comics. Sometimes we do, don't we? Sometimes I think um, because they're often a lot more. Um, Alan does a great job restoring the art. Just spot on. Really, it, it's. I'm guessing he must have um, had to take maybe um, just dirty old paper pages, you know, newsprint yeah. pages, mm. and had to work up the color from there. But he restores rather than recreates. I think it's the way he puts it. Yeah. Um, and but it just re- it reads as really fresh and is absolutely superb. I read it this morning over coffee. You know, I normally go to that place and read for the evening. You know, and I actually, I, I, I two hundred fifty six pages seems to go by in a flash. Absolutely brilliant. So my first one is the Lonely War of Captain Willie Shorts from Dark Horse. There you go. Nice, amazing. Uh, Dan, what have you got? Uh, I've got uh, Bullet Adventures, which got delivered hey. this week from the Kickstarter. I think we'd already read one. Because we've had Randy Stone on the, yeah. the pod before talking about uh, Bullet initially. <clears throat> and if you've ever read that comic, it, there's quite a definite end to it. Like, this is the end of the comic. Okay. So you're thinking, well, where's Bullet Adventure goes? Essentially, it's a soft retcon short reboot with a character. And he's sort of snatched from our timeline and dumped into the past. Uh I can't talk too much about certain aspects, otherwise you kind of ruin it, but he has his sort of powers back and he has to sort of <laughs> navigate this kind of his way back in time to get back to where he was, but he's, he's kind of stranded in the past. And his friend who kind of from the future sends him back because he's been sent back now, can't change what's happened. It's kind of, it's really well done. Like in as much that it doesn't worry itself too much about, uh, the, the negative consequences and of time travel, which I'm never too much of a fan of, but this is just done in the interests of getting the story going, which it does. And okay. uh, it's just really, when we had Randy on the the pod, one of the things about it, this is just comics, fun, enjoyable, just really good old fashioned comics, reading fun. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, it's really well drawn, not overly complicated. Uh, it's, the, the fight sequences action are absolutely fantastic. There's a whole, we've got the three issues because I backed on the Kickstarter and they did it all in one whack. And uh, I was jumping from one to the next. There's absolutely great stuff. It's like lands on cliffhangers and you just want to see what the, the next book bring, brings. I think there's another book after this uh, for issue four. So yeah, we've only got the first three, but I, I was hooked. I'd really recommend you, you, you check out, uh, Bullet Adventures. If you go to Randy Stone's Twitter, which I don't think he, I'm gonna have to scan through the comic. Uh, if you just look up Randy Stone on Twitter, I'm sure there'd be a, a links there on how to uh, get the comic and what have you. It's great in the back as well. There's some like uh, links to other comics that he's got on the go, which look just oh, as great. One. Yeah. Uh, so do do check that out. Nice. But, yep. uh, lots of fun. Nice. Okay. So we've um, got a reader's letter section in the back. Oh, that's nice. I, I, <laughs> yeah, love, cool. I love stuff like that. Yeah. Um, my my pick for this week was one is a Comicsology Originals. That nice. I via my sort of prime reading sort of experiment that I'm doing at the moment, the whole library renting things and all that jazz, trying to figure out how yeah. it works. Spoilers. It's a fucking pain to figure all this. <laughs> I realise I don't have it. You got to pay extra for that, haven't you? Um, have you got? Prime. I've got I've got Prime, but not isn't the, it under Kindle the, Unlimited? The Kindle Unlimited is different to the Comicsology Originals. Fuck me, because I was looking I, at I, I believe. Fuck. Yes, that's the thing I have pointed out, and another one of the reasons it's frustrating because you do there are titles on there that it, it says are part of the Kindle Unlimited, and you have to buy it to read it, or you know, or you have to be part of the Kindle Unlimited. But the Comicsology Originals, seemingly, I'm not signed up for Kindle Unlimited. I'm not because that message comes up, 
but with Prime, included in, in, with your membership, you can borrow 10 books at a time. Prime reading, is it? Oh, yeah, I've got to, that. I've got it. Yeah, I don't yeah. have to look that because I've got Prime. So, yeah, should... Prime, so Prime reading, So you, which means you can essentially rent out. It's like a library. You can rent out 10 titles and then, you know, that was the... the um, the nice house on the lake that I talked about last week, um, and this one's a, a single issue, uh, first issue called Grammaton Punch. Um, this uh, the creators. I'm gonna. I took a screenshot of it because um, I I read a lot of these usually on like my desktop wallpaper. Right. Not okay. Desktop wallpaper, but it's not always the best. Like because sometimes I just want to look at what's the book, it. Book I've heard nothing but complaints about people when they read on the desktop format. They yeah, just, it, it's like one it. of those. Sometimes I just want to look at the book details, and I have to find a different link. Do you know what I mean? There's not even a simple way to do that. You have to open up a different page. Does but, it do guided view? Th- it does. It does, but not in the way, not in the glorious way that we're used to. Let's oh. um, <laughs> say so that Grammaton Punch is from Miles Miles Gunther is the writer, and Brian Anden artist lee lowridge the colors taylor esposito letters that's a name i've i've read in many, yeah, books. many times yeah, yeah, yeah. d cuniff cover colors yeah. ed dukeshire logo and design um this is issue one of um what i can imagine will be a mini series or an ongoing series a lot of these things like that but basically um it's a simple synopsis as well born on an eclipse van nygen Nyigen, oh, I'm going to, I've murdered that name. I never remember that fucking name. Uh, uh has the ability to see ghosts that feed off the energy of unsuspecting adults. Unfortunately, being extra makes him a target for these evil spirits. But what he soon realizes is Van can fight back. Um, this was, and the, you look at the cover; it, it's almost got like a superhero sort of cover energy to it. Um, and this, it, it's spelled G R A double M A T O N punch that's that just just in case i murdered the pronunciation okay um cool. but the cover is very much this this sort of character with like sunglasses you know aviator sunglasses on and they seem to have like a sort of force field almost around their fists as they're punching um it's it's very much got a sort of almost like an animated energetic animated uh, art style from from andon which totally lends itself to this story but it is very much. It's exactly what it says on the tin. This there was a solar eclipse, and this and um, Van was a kid that was born around this. And when when we say, oh, he can see dead people, you always think of the sixth sense, but it's not really like that. The ghosts he can see are like strange and t- completely. It's comic book ghosts. Do you know what I mean? They're sort of like one of them just got a giant eye. And uh, when he was a baby, he was haunted by this one ghost that would like just feed off his energy, just totally sort of which. Which then lent to uh, no one knew, you know, he could see them, but he didn't say anything. But it was constantly feeding his energy, which meant he was in and out of doctors. They couldn't, they couldn't say what it was. Um, you know, he was always exhausted. And uh, they found out there was something special about his eye. You know, he he couldn't go out in sort of daylight, so he had, he had to permanently sort of wear sunglasses, which meant he's got these cool little sort of aviators. But when you're a little kid at school, anything that makes you different. You know, made his life sort of difficult, and then, and he was con- constantly sort of tormented by this ghost as it, as he grew up as a toddler, and then one day, like the ghost went to take more of his energy, and he's only a little kid, and he snapped back, and he turned, he turns around and grabs the ghost and just punches it in the face, and suddenly re- suddenly realizes that if they can touch <clears throat> him, then he can punch them back. Um, and <laughs> it goes around punching ghosts. He's, so essentially, mm. this is going to be a puncher. book. Yeah, yeah, it's totally going to be a, a, a series about a kid that can punch ghosts, and I am all for it. I bet he ain't afraid of them. Yeah, no. Uh. <laughs> um, and he kept sort of um, his mother as well was like a she's like a power lifter, like a you know. So it's a weird family dynamic. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an interesting. That's why I, one of the things that appealed to me about it. Well, is, is it wasn't his mother's clearly a character in it, and she certainly, as soon as you see her, she's got like wide shoulders, and you know there's something a bit different about her. And um, it, of course, he didn't know it was unusual when he was a kid, and he would go to these powerlifting competitions, and then when he saw the other people that she was competing against, there were other powerlifter ghosts, sort of feeding off their energy and making them like really exhausted and then he decides to kick their ass as well so and and the story is developing and sort of going on and i can't wait to see 
uh, you know, by the end of the first, the first issue just flew by. He meets a ghost in an arcade that actually hits him back, and it's the first one that, instead of running, it sort of slaps him. So I think there's going to be some proper sort of ghostly, ghostly fights. Um, because when this ghost hits him, it sort of loosens one of his teeth, so he needs to go to the dentist. And as he's put under the anaesthetic, it's a great little scene, actually. He's put under the anaesthetic, and of course, as he's sort of like falling asleep, the original ghost that took his energy appears. And it's, it's, it's so... I loved this series. I just thought, oh, this looks quite interesting. I thought it was going to be a bit... I didn't expect it to get as much of a kick out of it as I as I did. And it's a fun little... Okay fun little premise that hopefully there will be some there's a there's definitely a hint to a bigger story a bigger sort of arc that's going to be for five i imagine for four or five issues i'm, I'm on board um and punching ghosts i mean as soon as you say that you just think it's cool anyway yes so, <laughs> so what is that like just one issue and they update it every this is one month issue or week or? yeah this is one issue but looking at it um you, there's already you can't see the covers yet but yeah there's gonna be one out at the start of april um there's another uh three i think there's five books so i'm not sure how the comicsology originals things necessarily work like how because as well as you see some bigger uh, you know you, you obviously you see some bigger creators that are part of it but you also have the indie creators that are obviously signing up their books is it have comicsology just purchased an entire a book that's already done and then they're releasing it at certain points do you know what i mean I, it's Something I like, don't really understand no, don't the, the, the boring aspect of it because surely you just you read it and then you're done with it. Why yeah. do you need it to download it? To you can only have a limit on how many you've downloaded. I mean, I but. think I think with the, the originals, I think if you have if you don't have Prime, you got to buy it anyway. Do you know what yeah, I mean? it's, okay. it's, still, it's still a comicsology book, but um, yeah, it, yeah, it's, it is exactly that, Dan. I don't own the book. No, I just read it. Which in some ways, um, it's. It's it... ideal for trying out like a first issue like this. Yeah. I think you know you can dip your toe in without without thinking. Fuck off. They'll get it. sales out of it, won't they? They'll get yeah. physical sales yeah. when they finally print it, I guess, and stuff. Yeah, you know? exactly. I, I thought it'd be like the, the downloads. You know, when you got the the Prime app, you can download a film, and they say, "Well, oh, you've got so many days left to watch yeah. this before you got to re-download yeah. it or some yeah. shit." Yeah. Um, whereas, like, um, I read the third issue of Nemesis Reloaded. Um, yeah. Again, like more the same, and also like Local Man. That's in my in which I. It, hugely enjoyed um Good. to find out more about that listen to last week's episode um mm. you know that that's part of my library of course who knows if that disappear one day whereas the nice like, <laughs> yeah, like, never, like, never sure are we like tony yeah. said like the nice house on the lake um blitz through it and i'll return it as i because i think i'm gonna read it again i'm gonna return it but i'm gonna end up buying that book just to have on my shelf Fair do you know what yeah. i mean because uh, i'll also i'll just want the book um, but get the hardcover or something when it comes out. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, it, exactly, yeah. exactly. And the prime reading at the moment is it's an interesting sort of little experiment that I'm doing doing with this because I bought another sort of indie comic. I'm not going to name it because I actually spent money on it and I shouldn't have spent money on it because it was shit. Yeah. So <laughs> welcome to my world. So it's yeah. one of those. Uh, right, okay, okay. Uh, I got stung a little bit there, so let's let's rent something. <laughs> no, I guess so. It sounds. I mean, the thing is, I'll still I'm still going to order books from actual individual creators like physical copies but it's the convenience of digital books is quite difficult at the moment i think especially sifting through to find the gems does that make sense oh totally yeah i like yeah. truly i'm kind of, a lot of the time i'm buying with my eyes as in like yeah i see the artwork and think oh well, actually they paid a fucking decent artist for this yeah and then yeah. i've read it and like fuck me like d- d- dude that's why i love the marvel and dc apps yeah yeah, most so much reading. Yeah, on them. I read forty comics when I was away on the Marvel yeah. app. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but at the moment, I think uh, Comicsology Originals is exclusive digital content, which is only available on Comicsology and Kindle. Um, so th- that's the only place you can get about. Which is a shame because I think a book like this has further, um, sort of, it can, it can do a bit more but okay oh oh saying that imprint via dark, dark horse books so maybe it, I'm wrong some of them that. have got to deal with dark horse haven't they? Yeah. They, this, yeah. this one clearly has so maybe maybe if you see it mm. see it on a shelf via dark horse it's, it's worth if you just want some fun comics and people punching ghosts get Gram- grammaton punch 
There you oh. go. Cool. Big shout, a little shout out from Tom Curry who sent the current arc on Chainsaw Man on the Shojin Jump app is absolutely fucking great. Is it? That was always yeah. a fucking head trick, yeah. that one. But I think it's mm. gone, it's kind of taken a bit of a... The second volume's taken a turn, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, nice. So uh, mm. I have to get back on there because that's one app I've got and I've not bloody mm. read in a little while. No. Yeah. Uh, Tony? Uh, my final one is I ordered some mini comics from Andy Watson. Um, I'd read the book tour a few years ago by Andy and really enjoyed it. And I think I recommended it on this show a couple of years oh. ago, I think during lockdown, actually. Um and it's lovely to see when I was in Angoulême that the, that, that book is something of a darling of the BD scene, actually. Um, bearing in mind, Andy is from the UK. Um, Al Henderson is always saying that I should read more by him. So I've, in my never-ending, our, our never-ending crusade to find small press books, I thought I'd order some of his mini comics off him. They're smaller than A5. Uh, they're only two ninety nine each. I ordered three for nine. That cost me nine ninety six. But I also got a postcard. I got a note and a sketch from him, and I got oh. a bookmark. So that's not bad, is it? No, not yeah. at all. That's, yeah, pretty, that's pretty good. Pretty good value. Um, and each comic has at least at least a couple of different stories in it. I think doing a bit of research into it, I know page forty five was selling like a collect like a box set of them. I think there's fourteen of them all. I think available. Um, and I grabbed uh, three. I grabbed one called Fiction, another called The City Never Sleeps, and one called Love Removal Men. Um, and he's got a sort of sharp, cartoony kind of style. I'm going to put him somewhere in the same artistic DNA as Stephen Appleby and Ronald Searle, somewhere like that, but with perhaps more of an eye to use of colour and a more of a sort of angular graphic sensibility. You see when you have a look at him online, you'll see what I mean. Um, they often tell simple and sort of warmly funny, moving everyday stories um in one short he compares writing and planning a story to the laying of a dinner table which is quite simple but quite a nice little fun bouncy story another one seems to come from a bad dream about removal men turning up so removal men turn up at his door and he says oh um i'm sorry uh i'm not moving now i've decided not to but they force their way in and they take everything so they take wallpaper um they take all his furniture obviously they take um his photographs from his computer and they delete all the emails from his ex-lover so they take everything and leave him there sitting on his own. Um, they're all very short. Um, they straddle that sort of fun and clever without being smug or self-serving, which I think sometimes when we get that little area of cartooning, I think some people sort of fall into that um, smug, smug self-serving area. But these are actually genuinely funny. I think possibly I needed this little bit of relief after reading, having the assault on the nerves that the lonely war of Captain Willie Schultz was on me today. Um, so I really enjoyed it. It was a nice little counterpoint to that. Yeah, if you go to page 45, there's a box set of all 14 you can get from them if they've got any left available. If not, they've got quite a little showcase of the books. They're very small. They've got an eye, eye to, a bit like standing outside and sweating, which we talked about last week. They look like art deco pamphlets, I suppose, in a way. They've kind of got that sort of heavy design thing to them. They're, they're, and they're a lovely little thing, a bit like um, Colossus Cartographies. They're a nice sort of shape and size to have a little collection of. Um, they're all sort of consistent in their design style. Um, also out is Sunburn, which Andy did with Simon. Mm-hmm. I think Simon Game, I think the guy's name is, um, and that's getting a lot of heat at the moment. I think that's a very popular book. Um, you can find him on Patreon, Patreon.com, Andy Watson, Andy with an I, and on Twitter you can find Andy Comics, Andy with an I again, Andy Comics, and I think he uses Andy Comics across social media, so you can find him anywhere like that. But he's an interesting, thought-provoking, funny, quirky, almost slightly retro style which I really appreciated. Um, if you want to get out, go and get these mini comics, go and get them. But if you haven't read the book tour, go and get that as well, which is a, is a great read. That's my last one. There you go. Nice. So there you go, folks. Plenty of uh, comics and books for you to check out this week, as always. And we hope you, um, if you get them, we hope you enjoy them because that's what this medium and this hobby is all about. So um, if there's <laughs> anything you want us to talk about on future shows, please get in touch with us. You can email us awesomecomicspod at gmail.com. You can uh, follow us on social media at the awesome pod. Once again, please join the Slack group if you want to join a community of wonderful people who are just there to talk comics. Get in touch with us about that. Thank you for listening to us, whether it's on the website awesomecomics.podbean.com. If you listen to us on other networks such as Apple, Spotify, Amazon, Stitcher, Podnose, Podknife, what other networks are we on? We're on Pod. It's such a fine line between stupid and clever. It's uh, so very fun. 
it's very, <laughs> it's such a fine line. It's a, that's a network that I highly agree with. <laughs> I hope to cross over to the uh, clever camp at some point. But... Yeah, 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 no. we'll, we'll all never get there. You know that. We'll never, we can, never we can see it over the fence. Yeah, We're looking at yeah, them. Yeah. They're looking at us with The grass thing. looks nice, doesn't it? The grass looks nice. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, you know. yeah. I don't talk but about it, boobs half as, not, half yeah. as much as we do. Do, do a quick, uh, not an apology, but like, I know I keep crapping on the current X Men books. I can't help it. I, I don't like them. Uh, I should stop reading them. I only seem to read them when someone gets incensed by them. I go, let me read this. And then you read it and it goes, yeah, it's shit. But I'm, I'm not reading the majority of it, so I can't. I can't the main one's it. all right. I don't mind Wolverine and X-Force okay. as well, to be fair. Yeah, but okay. yeah. Okay. yeah. Yeah. Read the things you enjoy. Yeah. Except yeah. if you me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dan just hate reads. He just sits again. Ah, yeah. He's fucking things. Uh, I've got a paper cut as well. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Where can people find us online, etc.? Tony? Neveronanything.com. And it will be the third year of the Never hey, On Anything podcast this week. Thanks a lot. Well done. Starting lockdown. And... Yeah, it's certainly something to do when I was bored. Yeah. And there carried on. It's uh, yeah. an, an achievement. Well done. Yeah. Thank you, mate. Yeah. Cheers. Guys. Go back and check out more of those episodes. When Just you've both these fuckers this. are on there. Have I been on one? Of, once <laughs> Don't or listen twice? to my one. There's absolutely no quality to be found there. But no, you do. We talked about the wrecking crew on yours, didn't we? Go, oh, I love yeah. the wrecking crew. Yeah, That's yeah wrecking crew. <laughs> but unlike Rogue Trooper, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if they'd have done them properly in a Thor film, they'd have been excellent. I tell you what, yeah. they should do them properly in the fucking comics. But that's a whole yeah. different conversation. You've been on there three times, Dan. Thinking about it, you did the one with PXD, didn't you? We did the one about um, the X Men or something, did we? And then you did. Uh, I did the Punish one. Uh, and then you also did um, Martial Law. Martial Law as well. There you go. Yeah. yeah. Three. Yeah. Cool. I'll, I'll chuck a topic. Read the hard way. I'll chuck a, chuck a topic your way again, Tony. And let's Ooh, get spicy. Saucy boy. Let's get yeah. spicy. Uh, speaking <laughs> of spicy, where can they find you, Dan? You can find me on Twitter at Vanguard Comic. And you can read Vanguard at VanguardComic.com. I'm currently it's working in. on a double page spread. Someone said, Why do people no longer do double page? Spreads in web comics. No, no, I'm gonna fucking. Do Dan hate replied you, to them. Yeah, yeah do, you, do you know what? You're easily influenceable, aren't you, Dan? Yeah. As long as it's in the Dan, negative. Fashion. Say yes, hey, Dan. Dan. Say Dan, yes. Why does nobody... Say yes. Yes. <laughs> Dan, why does nobody send me money in the post anymore? I'll yeah. fucking send you money oh, in the post. Show you. <laughs> you fucking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, seriously though check out Vanguard because it's a brilliant yeah webcomic. please do I'll tell you why they don't do double page web uh, double page comments in both double page spreads in web comments it's a fucking pain in the ass because generally your pay, your web page is set up to take single pages so if you do a double page it, it fucking hates it the website that you're going to be putting it on that's essentially why yeah mm. Yeah, but, you got to do some real clever thinking if you wanted to sort of strip it down to single page you got to do some very clever thinking narratively haven't you to get that to work yeah, essentially what I don't know, I, on the Vanguard one, I post one that fits, that's quite small, and then I have a link in the comments that when you click it, it takes you to Hyra so you can see the whole thing. That's, oh, that's the way around it. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Get in with his links. Uh, speaking of links, you can find me on social media at Jester Diablo. Thank you very much to Carl for joining us this week. And on the Great British Bake Off. I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. I'm going to talk about that in a, in a minute, Tony, once we finish recording. Oh, I so have, what the fuck see me? I have oh. things to say. And what I'm going to say right now is have a brilliant week, everyone, no matter where you are in the world. And I know our, our listeners have gone up a little bit. Thank you to everyone that has uh, and yeah. any new listeners. Thank you so much for listening to this show. Yes. We hope you enjoy it because we've got some fun topics of discussion coming up soon. There's going to be lots of uh, cool stuff and we want you people involved as well. So don't be surprised yeah. to hear us uh, put a shout out for some opinions and ideas. Yeah, but next surprise. week's already planned. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we hope you're happy, healthy, doing well, reading comics, making comics, and we love you very much. Don't we, Dan? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Tony? What kind of cake are you making? <laughs> <laughs> I'll make a fucking cake. No, I'll make, I'll make a cake. fucking cake. <laughs> I'll post you that fucking cake. I do want to laugh. I was going to, I was going to finish this episode just completely straight down the line. And I, <laughs> you broke me, you bastard. Uh, have a brilliant week, everyone. Read loads of comics. Bake loads of comics. And as always, what should they do, guys? Stay, Stay awesome. awesome. See ya. See you later. Bye.